Welcome to our second video in this module on sensation and perception. This is Kristen Lazarova, and we're going to be exploring sensory processes. In this video, you're going to be exploring sensory processes that include vision, taste, hearing, smell, touch, pain, including phantom limb pain, and other sensations. So let's get started. A key point that underlies what you're going to be learning about in this video is that psychology explores how our senses like sight, hearing, and taste, and others, help us to take in the world around us. We'll begin by looking at vision. And the eye, of course, is the major sensory organ that's involved in vision. As you'll recall from the last video, sensation is the detection of stimuli. And this is energy from the world around us that affects us in some way. Our eyes, our ears, and other sensory organs are packed with receptors. And receptors are specialized cells that convert environmental energies into signals for the nervous system. What we call light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Light is visible only because our receptors respond to wavelengths of a particular frequency. The electromagnetic spectrum is the continuum of all frequencies of radiated energy, and you can see them here in this image. This ranges from gamma rays to X-rays with very short wavelengths through ultraviolet and visible light and then to infrared to radio and microwave transmissions, which are very long wavelengths. And again, light is only visible because our receptors are responding to wavelengths of a certain frequency. And so you can see here that we respond to wavelengths that range from about 380 to 740 nanometers. If we had different receptors, we would see a different range of wavelengths. Can you imagine being able to see radio waves or ultraviolet waves? Well, many insects and birds actually can see frequencies or light waves that we cannot. They can see ultraviolet wavelengths that are obviously beyond our ability to see. If you'll take a look at this image, you'll see at the very bottom a very small segment of the visible light spectrum. And you can see how small this is in contrast to the rest of the energy that's on this spectrum. So there's a lot that we cannot detect, but it's this small amount ranging from 380 to 740 nanometers that we are able to detect. And that's what allows us to see to see all of the colors around us, to see the leaves on the tree, to see the colors of different flowers, to see the sunset or anything that we're looking at. It's just this small portion of this electromagnetic spectrum that we're detecting that is providing us with this ability. Of course, that's only part of the story. We're going to be taking a look at the overall process of vision. So how do we experience color? How is it that we are able to detect something as being red or blue or green? Well, different wavelengths of light are associated with our perception of different colors. So longer wavelengths are in the reds. If you look at this image, you'll see that longer wavelengths, a higher number, is associated with more red colors. Intermediate wavelengths, they're associated with the greens those that are in towards the center towards or more towards the left. And then if you look at shorter wavelengths, those are associated with blues and violets. And we don't see all of that on this screen here, but you can see part of it as we move over to the 500s and below. The amplitude of light waves is associated with how bright or intense the color is, and larger amplitudes appear brighter. Now that we've looked at the very important role of light waves, let's move into the visual system. So first, light waves are transmitted across the cornea, and then they enter through the pupil. You'll see the pupil and the cornea here in this image. Now, as most of you probably know, when it's dark, your pupil gets larger, and this is because the pupil is letting more light in. 
and when it's bright, your pupil is getting is going to get smaller, and this is because it's regulating that amount of light that's coming into your eye. You also probably remember from an earlier module when you learned about the brain and the sympathetic nervous system that our fight or flight response results in a dilation of our pupils. In other words, our pupils get larger, and this is because we are then having more light coming into our eyes so we can see better. So it's preparing us to fight or to flee. Our body's doing this as we experience a stressor or some type of threat in our environment. So the pupil size is controlled by muscles that are connected by the iris. And the iris is the colored part of the eye. The light then crosses the lens and it's focused on the fovea, which is part of the retina. Now, I just wanna add an interesting piece of information here. And this is related to human development, but it's also related to our discussion on vision. As people get older, their lens becomes less flexible. And so now that you know that the lens focuses light onto the fovea, and you'll see in a moment that the fovea contains photoreceptors, you can imagine if a lens is less flexible, it's not going to do as good of a job at focusing light on the retina or on the fovea. So as people get older and their lens becomes less flexible, they're not able to see as well, especially objects that are very close. And so you might find that people, as they get into their 40s, they're needing to hold a book or a menu a bit far away from their eyes. And this is a very natural process that happens as people get older. And it's again because of that lens becoming less flexible. And this is where people may need to get reading glasses. So the fovea, which is part of the retina, contains photoreceptors. And if you look at this image, you'll see the fovea, you'll see the retina, and the photoreceptors are connected to retinal ganglion cells. And axons from these cells then exit through the back of the eye where they form the optic nerve. So let's stop here for a moment. Photoreceptors, these are visual receptor cells, okay? And when we think about vision, we need to remember that this is a sensory process and it's going to involve something you learned about in the previous video. It's going to involve transduction. This is the conversion of stimulus energy into nerve impulses. And that's what's happening here. We're having the conversion of that energy into nerve impulses. You see the word axon, for example, and you should be reminded of neurons. You learned about that in an earlier module. So axons, again, from these cells, they exit through the back of the eye where they form the optic nerve. Now, let me ask you, think to yourself for a moment. Where do you think in the brain this information goes? Which particular lobe of the brain did you learn about in an earlier module that plays a significant role in visual processing? Was it the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, or occipital lobe? It's the occipital lobe. And so when we think about visual processing, it is not something that's just taking place in our eyes. It's taking place to a significant degree in our brain and is due to a large degree to the optic nerve. So all of these parts of the visual system play a very important role in visual processing. And any problem along the way, whether it be in the eye, on the optic nerve, maybe a tumor, for example, or something that's gone awry in the occipital lobe, perhaps a stroke or a tumor or some sort of injury, then we're going to see visual processing being affected. So the optic nerve is then carrying the visual information to the brain. You'll notice as you look at this image that at the back of the eye, again, is the retina containing those photoreceptor cells. And you'll notice that there is a very small area where there is an absence of the retina. And this is right as you look towards the uh, center back of the eye where the optic nerve is. And this is what we would call our blind spot. And this is where there's a point of no receptors. 
This is where information exits the eye and where we cannot respond to visual information. What I would like for you to do while you're watching this video is after I share this with you, I'd like for you to pause and I'd like for you to try what I'm about to tell you at home or wherever you are as you're watching this video. What I'd like you to do is I'd like for you to take your left hand, cover your right eye, and I'd like for you to sit up straight in your chair or wherever you're sitting, and I'd like for you to then take your right hand, so cover your left, cover your left eye with your left hand. And then what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to take your right arm and I'd like for you to put one finger up and put it directly in front of you and stretch that arm out so that your arm is stretched out and you have your left eye covered with your left hand. And I'd like for you to align your finger with something right around it. It might be a point on the wall, it might be something on your computer if, you, if that's what you're looking at, uh, if that's what's directly in front of you. And I'd like for you to Look at that finger and whatever it is that it is pointing at or that it's aligned with, I should say. You should have it up in the air, not pointing forward, but up in the air. And I'd like for you to gradually move your finger into your peripheral vision, but don't move your eyes. Continue to look at whatever your finger was aligned with, whether it was on your computer screen, the wall, or whatever. Don't follow your finger. And as you do this, very slowly, I want you to, again, continue looking forward. And notice that very soon, as you move your finger, there's a point at which the top of your finger disappears. You could do the same thing by covering your right eye and pointing out with your left hand. You'd find the exact same thing happens. It's about somewhere like 7 to 10 degrees out from whatever your finger was aligned with where you're going to see that your finger disappears. And the reason that this happens is because of your blind spot. This is because that information, whatever it is that your finger was aligned with, is not hitting those photoreceptor cells on your fovea, on your retina. And so it's not picking up that information. But if you'll notice when you look at the world around you, you never notice your blind spot. You're not walking down the steps at your house and falling down because you suddenly found that one of the steps was in your blind spot. If you're at school and you're walking down the hall, you're not asking your friend to move out of your blind spot. You don't because your brain is filling in those missing pieces. And I think that this is a great example of the difference between sensation and perception. Our sensory receptors are picking up on all of this. They're not missing anything, but your brain is filling in missing pieces because of perception. It's organizing your world. It's giving more meaning than what might actually be there. So if you have a moment, go ahead and pause your video and try that or try that later. But it is very interesting for you to see that and be able to think about the difference between sensation and perception. So again, our light waves are entering the eye through the pupil, that tiny opening behind the cornea. The pupil regulates the amount of light that's entering the eye by contracting, in other words, getting smaller in bright light and then dilating in uh, dark light, in other words, getting larger. And the pupil size is controlled by the muscles that are connected to the iris, right? We talked about that just a moment ago, and this is that colored portion of your eye. And once it's past the pupil, the light passes through the lens. And the lens, as I mentioned, becomes less flexible as a person gets older. And this focuses the image on the fovea, which is a thin layer of cells in the back of the eye. And remember, the back of the eye is where the retina is. And then here we see the optic nerve. In this image, you'll see a more detailed picture of the fovea. So remember, the fovea contains photoreceptor cells and they're very densely packed. And these photoreceptor cells that are known as rods and cones, they're light detecting cells. The cones are specialized types of photoreceptors that work best in bright light conditions. Cones are very sensitive to acute detail 
and they provide a lot of resolution. They are also directly involved in our ability to perceive color. Now, while cones are concentrated in the fovea, where images tend to be focused, rods, which are another type of photoreceptor, they're located throughout the remainder of the retina. And they are specialized photoreceptor cells that also respond to light, but they work really well in low light conditions. And while uh, rods are, um, you know, while rods lack this, the resolution, the degree of acuity that cones do and the color function of cones, they're involved in our vision in dimly lit environments and our perception of movement in our peripheral field. So if you were in your bedroom, for example, and you turn the lights on, it's very bright, your cones are going to be very active and you're going to notice all the subtle variations in color. Maybe you have a couple of blue shirts and maybe they're close in color, but not exact. And you can notice the very dis, you know, fine differences between those two blue shirts and their colors. With rods though, if you turn off the lights or you dim them, let's say, let's say you dim the lights quite a bit, you're going to notice that your ability to see fine details is decreased. And this is because you have less cones that are active and more rods that are. You'll also notice that your ability to detect the fine differences between those two blue shirts, it's diminished, but you're able to see in a dimly lit environment. And you're also able to see well in your peripheral visual field. Now rods are also active in daylight. It's not as though they're not active, but the predominant activity that we are depending upon in daylight is we're depending upon cones. We're depending upon them for our ability to detect color and to um, notice the fine details. So again, here's our process. We have light waves. The light waves are hitting the fovea and the retina. We talked about rods and we talked about cones. And rods and cones are connected to retinal ganglion cells. And axons from the retinal ganglion cells, and these are a type of neural cell, they converge and exit through the back of the eye to form the optic nerve. And the optic nerve then carries visual information from the retina to the brain. So there are many steps involved in this process. And it's quite amazing to think about how complex this process is, which we have just touched the surface of, and to think about how quickly this process happens. The optic nerve of each eye merges at what is called the optic chiasm. And if you'll notice here in this image, this is an X-shaped structure that's just below the cerebral cortex. So this image here shows the optic chiasm at the front of the brain, and it shows the pathways to the occipital lobe at the back of the brain, where those visual sensations are processed into meaningful perceptions. Information from the right visual field is sent to the left hemisphere. And then information from the right visual field is sent to the left hemisphere. And this information is then sent to the occipital lobe for processing. Let's now take a look at color vision. How is it that we have the ability to detect so many different colors? Well, there's a theory that's called trichromatic theory of color vision, and it says that color vision depends on a relative response of three types of cones. So one type of cone is most sensitive to short wavelengths, and we generally see these as blue. Another type of cone is responsive to medium wavelengths, and we see this generally as green. And then another type is responsive to long wavelengths, and we see this one as red. And every wavelength of light produces its own distinct ratio of responses by three kinds of cones. It's kind of like mixing paints, but we're talking about light. So the results are different when we mix paints than when we mix light, because if we were to mix, let's say, paint 
in, we mix, let's say red, green, and blue, and we mix them in equal quantities, we would find that the color that results is black or like a brownish black. But if we mix these three colors in the form of light, all three of those equal white. But it's a similar principle where there's a mixing of these wavelengths of light that allow us to detect color. Have you ever noticed though that if you stare at something green, for example, or yellow or blue, that you see a different color? You might see red, blue, or a yellow after image. Well, this theory called opponent process theory accounts for these after images. And this theory says that we perceive color in terms of paired opposites, red versus green. So you stare at something red for a long time, and then you may look away or look at something else and you see green, yellow versus blue, and white versus black. And researchers have found that this tendency happens not because of what's happening in the retina, but because of what's happening in the cerebral cortex. So our ability to detect color doesn't seem to just be due to what's happening in our eyes, more specifically in our retina, but also what's happening in our brains. So researchers have found then that both theories are true, but for different parts of the visual system. So what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to stare at the white dot in this image, in the center of this flag for 30 to 60 seconds, and then move your eyes to a blank piece of white paper. And so you'll need to pause the video to do this and then reflect on to yourself, what do you see? After you do this, you're going to know that the color pairings of the opponent process theory lead to a negative after image. And an after image is a continuation of a visual sensation after the removal of the stimulus. And this is happening and can be explained by opponent process theory. And this is happening in our brains. It's not happening in our retina. Let's now explore hearing. The ear is divided into three sections. This includes our outer ear, our middle ear, and our inner ear. The outer ear is comprised of the pinna and the tympanic membrane, or our eardrum. So the pinna is the part of the ear that you can see that gives your ear its shape. And it's shaped the way that it is to help to funnel that moving air in, because it's the movement of air that is ultimately contributing to your ability to hear. The middle ear contains what are called three auditory ossicles, and this includes our malleus, incus, and stapes, or you might also know these as being the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, so named because of their shape. And then we have the inner ear, and it's comprised of the cochlea and basilar membrane, and these are just a few of the parts of the ear. Let's first start with the pinna. The pinna is that outer structure of the ear that I mentioned just a moment ago, and it funnels sounds to the inner ear where our receptors are. And our ears convert sound waves into nerve impulses. And this is through the process that's known as transduction. You'll remember learning about transduction in that last video. Sound waves are vibrations of air and water or other medium, and they vary in their frequency and in their amplitude. These sound waves then move through the ear canal. And then these sound waves vibrate the eardrum. And three tiny bones, the ones I mentioned just a moment ago, the malleus, incus, and stapes, also known as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, they convert the eardrum's vibrations into vibrations in the cochlea. So then what happens and I want you to look at the third yellow block because this is where we are. We've already had sound waves traveling along the auditory canal, and then they strike the tympanic membrane, causing it to vibrate. 
then this vibration causes those three auditory ossicles to move. And then this presses something called the stapes into the oval window of the cochlea. And then the fluid in the cochlea begins to move and this stimulates the hair cells. And hair cells are sensory receptors for sound which become activated. And then the hair cells, they generate neural impulses that travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. And then auditory information ends up making its way to the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe for processing. Now, you might ask yourself, what do I need to know for test number two from this information? Do I need to know every single detail of this? For a student in psychology, I think it's important for you to have an understanding of the overall process, but you do not need to know specific details. I won't be asking you about the stapes or the oval window, but I do think it's relevant for you to note that there are three auditory ossicles that move because ultimately of sound waves or moving air that has traveled along the auditory canal. And so a question I might ask would be, what are the three auditory ossicles? I think it's also important for you to note that the receptor cells in our ears are hair cells and that these become activated. And so what's happening here is transduction because these hair cells, they generate neural impulses that then travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. You should probably also know that it's the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe that this information travels to. So I won't be asking you every detail of this process, but you should have an overall understanding of what's taking place in addition to those um, specific things that I just mentioned. Now, I want to mention at this point that those hair cells that are in your inner ear, that they are very sensitive to loud noises. As a matter of fact, when you're exposed to very loud noises, those hair cells can become damaged. And once they're damaged, that's it. There's no replacing them. Maybe one day scientists will come up with a way to replace those hair cells, but until then, we need to be very, very cautious about being exposed to loud noises. Now, if you remember in the last video, you learned about something called sensory adaptation. And you'll remember the example that I gave you about the girl who gets into her car. And when she does, she notices that the music is very, very loud. And she didn't realize how loud it was because when she was in the car the day before, she gotten used to the loud music. And I think of each of you, I think of myself, in that we can be exposed to loud sounds continuously and get used to those sounds, not even realizing that we're being continuously exposed to decibel levels, which is the volume level, how loud something is, to high levels of decibels for a long period of time, and that this then can, just, can have a significant effect on our hearing by damaging those hair cells. And because of sensory adaptation too, again, we, we don't really realize that we are exposed to those loud sounds. We don't notice them. They're, you know, we get used to it. Maybe we're used to loud music. Maybe we're used to our TV being loud. Maybe we're used to working outside in the yard with our lawnmower. And we need to remember that Although we may be used to something and it doesn't sound loud, that doesn't mean that it's not. You can actually download a free app on your phone that is put out by the National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety. I think that's what it's called. I think it's N-I-O-S-H or H-S. You could do a search online for it. And there's a free app and there are many others where you can download the app, and then you can measure the decibel level in your environment. And I think you'd be really surprised by how loud things really are for um, that you may think are not very loud. And I'm gonna show you here in a moment what decibel levels are actually dangerous and can lead to hearing loss. So here we have decibels that range from zero to 140. 
So if you look at like a very quiet stream, this is at 20 decibels versus let's say being at a loud concert, which would be 120 decibels on average. I'm not going to ask you about frequency of sound waves and pitch and amplitude and um, you know any of this, but what I do want you to know is you should know about how our hair cells, what are called cilia in our inner ear can be affected by high levels of decibels. And that it's that constant exposure that can have a negative impact, but it can also be uh, infrequent exposure of extremely high decibel levels that can negatively affect our hearing. And again, I'd encourage you all to download the free app just to see how loud your environment is. You might end up finding out that it's a lot louder than you thought, and you might want to make some adjustments. And you can see a, uh, like a, you can have an idea here of what a typical conversation sounds like at 60 decibels, but maybe in your house, typical conversations are much louder. And uh, you might find that it's in the 70, 80 decibel range. And this for some people can actually contribute to feelings of anxiety and stress. So a lot of loud noise, isn't just bad for our hearing, it can cause psychological distress. It can have a negative effect on our health. Some people are more sensitive to loud noises. And this can also, this sensitivity can contribute to uh, our tendency to be uh, led into the fight or flight response. And remember, we've talked about that and being in that chronic state of vigilance can have a negative effect on our overall health. Hearing loss can happen for many different reasons though, and some people are born without hearing, and this is known as congenital deafness. Other people suffer from conductive hearing loss, and this is due to a problem delivering sound energy to the cochlea. And so the treatment for this type of hearing loss will be very different than it would be for someone who has just been exposed to loud sounds for much of their life and has damage to those hair cells. That person who has damage to hair cells, their treatment is going to be using a hearing aid. Whereas some of the other causes of hearing loss may have some other more advanced approaches. And so causes for conductive hearing loss can include a blockage in the ear canal, a hole in the tympanic membrane, problems with the ossicles. Remember the ossicles, they vibrate. And if they're not vibrating like they need to, then this is going to affect hearing. A person might also have fluid in their ear. They might have it in that space that's between the eardrum and the cochlea. You all have probably known someone, I know, I know a couple of people who, when they were kids, had fluid in their ear and it affected their ability to hear well and they had to have tubes in their ears. And then once that happened, then they were able to hear better and this had affected their speech too. And then they ended up, um, we ended up seeing improvements in, the, in their speech after that. And another group of people, they suffer from um, what is called sensory neural hearing loss. And this of course is the most common form of hearing loss. And this is where a person may be exposed to that loud noise. That's one cause, but there are other causes of this. It can be aging. It can also be due to some sort of head trauma or sound trauma. So maybe there's some incredibly loud sound that they were exposed to, and it was just that one instance that caused hearing loss. Infections and diseases can contribute to this as well, like measles or mumps. Some medications can affect hearing loss as well. And sometimes tumors can affect hearing and so too can toxins. So some of these toxins might be those that you would find in different solvents and metals. Let's now take a look at our chemical senses. So taste is known as gustation and smell is known as olfaction and they are known as the chemical senses and both have sensory receptors that respond to molecules in the food that we eat or in the air that we breathe. So both involve that process of transduction. There are four basic groupings of taste, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. And research demonstrates that we have at least six taste groupings and umami is our fifth taste. 
So umami is actually a Japanese word that roughly translates into yummy, and it's associated with a taste for monosodium glutamate. And so these, uh, there are receptor sites on our tongue and throughout our mouth for umami, and this is, we would call these glutamate receptors. And glutamate naturally is present in the savory foods, like in cheeses and olives, for example, but companies also make food that has something artificial called monosodium glutamate that gives that same experience. And some of you may have had monosodium glutamate or MSG in your food and it's given you a headache. Some of you may have found that when you eat food with this in it, that you find that it's really tasty and very savory and um, it's kind of hard to put that food down. Think about the food that is not natural. So we would talk about like, let's say, um, you know, chips like Doritos and sometimes those can taste really good and they're hard to put down because they are activating those glutamate receptors. That's the experience of umami. And there's also a growing body of evidence that suggests that we possess a taste for the fatty content of a given food. So how does taste happen? Well, molecules from the food and the beverages that we consume, they dissolve in our saliva and then they interact with taste receptors on our tongue and in our mouth and our throat. And taste buds, they're formed by groupings of taste receptor cells and they have hair-like extensions that protrude into the central pore of the taste bud. And you can see that picture here. And taste buds have a life of about 10 to 10 days to two weeks. So even destroying some, like if, ever, if you've ever burned your tongue, that will not have a long-term effect. They just grow right back. But I should point out that as people get older, it takes longer for those taste buds to grow back. So taste molecules, they bind to receptors on this extension. And then this causes chemical changes within the sensory cell that result in a neural impulse being transmitted to the brain by different nerves. And so what we're talking about here again is that process of transduction. We have that molecule that's binding to the receptor site, and then we have a conversion of that information into a neural impulse. So that process of transduction is happening here, just like it did with vision and just like it did with hearing. So taste information is transmitted to different parts of the brain that are playing an important role in taste. One of those that I think is interesting is the limbic system. And if you'll remember, the limbic system plays an important role in emotion and memory and motivation. So think about how food is so tied to emotion. Think about how often when you've felt sad or you felt down, for some of you, you might find yourself seeking out certain types of food. Uh, and also think about how some types of food may bring about certain feelings. Maybe you easily remember an experience of having a certain type of food with a family member, maybe over Christmas. And so when you eat that food away from that family member, it might bring about some good feelings. Let's now look at smell. So olfactory receptors, and remember olfaction is smell, and olfactory receptor cells, they're located in the mucous membrane at the top of the nose. And there are small hair-like extensions, are you noticing a pattern with hair-like extensions from these receptors that they serve as the sites for odor molecules. And so they're receptor sites and they take on different shapes of molecules. And when an odor molecule bind to a particular receptor, there are chemical changes within that cell that result in signals that are being sent to the part of the brain that's responsible for smell. And it's actually, it's called the olfactory bulb. It's shaped like a bulb and it's at the tip of the frontal lobe where um, the olfactory nerves begin. So this, this information that is being received and it's being received in the form of a molecule. So we have a molecule that's binding to receptor sites in your nose. It's causing the activation, it's causing the activation 
of receptor sites. It's causing signals to be created and then sent to the olfactory bulb. Okay, so it's then from this bulb that information is sent to the limbic system, just like when we were talking about taste. Now, if there's any sense that's tied to emotion, we would have to focus on smell. Of course, taste is, but smell is absolutely tied to emotion. And smell is tied to emotion for a variety of reasons. Think about, first of all, think about us as human beings, how important it is for us to be able to identify things that are dangerous to us. And smell is one way that we can without having to actually consume something. So we could smell something and then we can sense that there's danger. And that feeling of fear is an emotion. So this actually is an important survival connection or mechanism. Think too about yourself as you go into a store over the holidays. Perhaps you were at the grocery store and they had pine cones that were covered or sprayed with cinnamon and other smells. And you walk by those pine cones and you smell them and you're suddenly taken back to last Christmas when you were visiting one of your family members. Or maybe you suddenly have these feelings of warmth and comfort and you feel relaxed because you've associated those smells with being with your family. And of course, the store's using this to make you feel good, to make you feel relaxed because they know that you're more likely to spend money, you're less likely to be inhibited. So smell is very much tied to our emotions for those for the reason of survival and many more. And transduction is where we have the chemical changes that cause signals to be sent to the olfactory bulb. And interestingly, for all of our senses, information first goes to the relay station of the brain. And if you'll remember from the last module, that's the thalamus. But for smell, it doesn't go to the thalamus. It goes directly to the olfactory bulb. And this goes back to survival. Think about every moment that you're delaying making a good choice that's related to your safety, you may be in danger. So if it takes a little bit of extra time for information about smell, which provides us with a lot of information about potential dangers, if it takes a little bit of extra time to go to our thalamus first, the relay station, and then to the olfactory bulb, we may be less likely to survive. But if it goes straight to the olfactory bulb, that's quicker processing, increasing our chance of survival. Some of you may have wondered about pheromones. Probably many of you have heard of pheromones, and these are chemical messages that are sent by another individual. And it turns out that these airborne compounds that animals and humans release, they send signals about our moods. Uh, they can even send signals about sexual orientation and genetic makeup. There was a really interesting study that was done not too long ago, where a neurobiologist in Israel found that what they did first actually is they had women watch a sad movie scene. And so when the, woman, when the women watched this scene, they collected the tears that the women had, and then they placed the samples of, the, of this unidentified fluid under men's noses. And the tears didn't elicit empathy, in a standard lab test. But interestingly, what they did is they reduced men's sexual arousal and their testosterone levels. So what the researchers concluded was that maybe the tears sent a message that romance was off the table. So the men were not aware of these tears. They didn't know what it was that they were detecting, but they were getting some sort of information at an unconscious level, you could say. And this had to do with their pheromones. There was another study that was done in 2005, and they found that um, gay men who were given anonymous samples of sweat preferred the scent of gay men, and heterosexual men preferred the scent of women. So these men had no idea what they were smelling, but they had these preferences based upon what information those pheromones were providing.
And there's another interesting study where researchers asked women to rate the odors of t-shirts that were worn by different men who played basketball without wearing deodorant and all the men wore white t-shirts and they gave the t-shirts to the women to smell and women preferred men whose dna was different enough from their own that it would increase the chance of producing a child with a very robust immune system with varied immune system uh, varied immunities and while there are lots of products out there, especially colognes or perfumes that are thought to or advertised to be able to attract a mate through the use of pheromones, there has yet to be the identification of a pheromone that would make someone attracted to you. But that doesn't mean that researchers aren't still looking. Are you very sensitive to the different tastes of food? In other words, are you a super taster? Well, a super taster is a person who experiences the sense of taste with much greater intensity than average. So if you do feel that you're that way, you might be the person who finds that food that most people say isn't very spicy, you think is very spicy. Or perhaps you're the person who finds food that most people say isn't that salty to be very salty. Now keep in mind, this is outside of sensory adaptation. If we're regularly eating salty food, then eventually we're going to get used to it and it's going to take more salt for us to notice the salt. And so if you're a person who doesn't eat much salty food, you may find food salty that your friends don't. That does not make you a super taster. We're talking about all other things being equal. Are you very sensitive to taste? Sometimes super tasters are also very sensitive to noise. So when it's really loud, they experience much more stress and anxiety than other people who are not so sensitive to noise. Sometimes super tasters are also sensitive to different fabrics on their skin. So they might not like scratchy materials, whereas maybe their friend doesn't even notice that the material that they're wearing is scratchy at all. I'm going to be placing some um, links on the content page of the course site under supplementary learning materials that are related to super tasters. And I'd encourage you to check that material out. Another sensory ability that we have, of course, is the ability to detect touch. And there are many different types of sensory receptors that are located in the skin. And each of these are attuned to specific touch-related stimuli. Some respond to pressure and low-frequency vibrations, and some will respond to light pressure, and some will respond to the feeling of the skin being stretched. So there are different types of receptors on the skin that detect different types of touch. So how does our experience of touch happen? Well, sensory information is collected from the receptors and then also from free nerve endings. And then this travels up the spinal cord and it's transmitted to different regions of the brain. I'm not going to be asking you about specific regions of the brain or the role of the spinal cord and brainstem. I'm just providing this for you for context, but you should recognize and know about the somatosensory cortex. And the somatosensory cortex probably looks somewhat familiar to you. This sensory cortex is laid out based upon a correspondence between different parts of the body and their relationship to the amount of sensitivity or the amount of sensitivity that they have. So we have, for example, our hands, and you can see that our hands have quite a bit of cortex dedicated to them, considering how small our hands are when you compare the amount of space dedicated to the trunk. So if you see this image, the trunk is in red, the hands are in blue, and look how much less space is dedicated to the trunk versus the hands. Well, our hands have more space dedicated because they're more sensitive. So the relationship here is the more sensitive the area, the more brain space dedicated to that particular area. 
The limbic system, again, we keep coming back to this. If you'll remember, this is related to important structures such as the amygdala, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus. You don't need to know those now, but the limbic system, it makes sense that this would be connected to touch because the limbic system plays that role in emotion and motivation and memory. And we know that touch is connected to those experiences and feelings. And of course, we also have the ability to detect pain and pain perception is very important because it motivates us to remove ourselves from the cause of the injury. Although many of us would not like to feel pain, uh, if you think about it, imagine a life without pain. We could experience a lot of injuries and not realize it, which could lead to infection and potentially even loss of life. There are some very rare people who do not have the ability to detect pain. Being able to understand pain and the different types of pain is important if we want to understand human behavior. Think about, for example, as we looked at the last chapter or the last module on consciousness. You learned about drug addiction, and we know that because of pain, some people are prescribed medication that can be very addictive, and we know that this has led to the opioid crisis. Pain can have a very significant effect on one's psychological well-being. So that's why it's included in our understanding of sensation and perception. So pain that signals some type of tissue damage this is known as inflammatory pain. So if you've sprained your ankle, for example, or maybe you've fallen down and you, um, you, know, you hurt your foot or your leg. So the pain that you're experiencing from that is known as inflammatory pain. And so medications that are anti-inflammatories are going to be the ones that will help that kind of pain. In some situations, pain happens because of damage to neurons of either the peripheral or the central nervous system. And so the pain signals that are sent to the brain actually get exaggerated. And this type of pain is known as neuropathy or neuropathic pain. And you may know people who have this kind of pain. You may know people, for example, who have people who have diabetes. So a person who has diabetes can have damage to their nerves that lead them to not experience sensations. So they may not be receiving information about pain. This can be dangerous. For example, maybe that person is having some, you know, kind of early signs of a heart attack, but they don't feel that because of damage to those nerve cells that would otherwise let them know. But sometimes when people have diabetes, they may have pain also because of this damage to their nervous system. Sometimes people will describe this type of pain, this neuropathic pain, as a shooting or burning pain. And it may go away on its own for some people, but for others, it's unrelenting and it can be severe. And, um, Sometimes it can be due to a malfunctioning nervous system. So something's gone wrong with the neurons and like I said, their peripheral or their central nervous system. And there are some uh, things that can contribute to that like alcoholism, chemotherapy, multiple sclerosis, just to name a few. And we're going to be looking here in a moment at phantom limb pain and this can contribute to that as well. And then, we also, as I mentioned, have what's called congenital insensitivity to pain. And congenital means that it is present at birth and congenital insensitivity to pain is where a person has the inability to perceive physical pain. So from when that person is born, they never feel pain in any part of their body when they're injured. And they may, um, be able to detect, for example, they might be able to detect the difference between something being sharp and dull or hot and cold, but they can't sense that, let's say they're drinking a hot beverage, like if you're drinking really hot coffee, they can't sense that it's burning their tongue. And of course, then this lack of pain awareness, as I'd mentioned a moment ago, it can cause 
significant problems for the person. It can cause injuries that they may not be aware of that then can become infected. It can cause broken bones that they're not aware of that then they may not um, get the treatment that they need so that their bones heal properly. Let's now look at phantom limb pain. So records of people who've experienced phantom limbs after amputations have been around for centuries. And as the name suggests, people with phantom limb have the sensations like itching, seemingly coming from a missing limb. A phantom limb can also involve phantom limb pain. And this is sometimes described as the muscles of the missing limb uncomfortably clenching. And the mechanisms that are underlying this, they're still not fully understood, but there is some evidence that suggests that damaged nerves from the amputation might still be sending information to the brain and that the brain is reacting to this information. So there's an interesting treatment for the alleviation of this phantom limb pain, and it works by tricking the brain. And what the person or what their uh, physician would do is they would use a special mirror box to create a visual representation of the missing limb. And this technique, it allows the patient to manipulate this representation into a more comfortable position. I'm going to be placing a video about this in our supplementary learning materials section that I would encourage you to take a look at. Another sense that we're going to look at is the vestibular sense. This is probably one that you didn't think of when you thought about sensory systems. And the vestibular sense contributes to our ability to maintain balance and body temperature. And it's the major sensory organs of the vestibular system that are located in the inner ear that are responsible for our ability to have that sense of balance and body posture. When there is fluid that is in our inner ear and it is imbalanced, maybe we have too much fluid, maybe we have inflammation from an ear infection, this can have a negative effect on our vestibular sense. It can lead to vertigo. It can contribute to some feelings of dizziness. And if you've ever been in the car and maybe you were reading as a passenger, maybe you were in the back seat and you were reading and you've noted how quickly you became motion sick, this is because of your vestibular system. And in particular, it's because there's a lack of alignment that you're experiencing between what you're seeing as you're looking down at your book and the information that your brain is receiving from your inner ear. So the best thing to do, and most of you know this, is one, don't read in the car, but two, um, if you do tend to get motion sick and it doesn't take reading, but it just takes being a passenger in the car, looking straight ahead can help to alleviate that tendency to get motion sick because you're aligning what you're seeing with what's happening in your inner ear. A couple of other sensory systems that we have, we have proprioception, which is our perception of body position. And then we have kinesthesia, which is our perception of the body's movement through space. So we, for example, when we're walking, we don't need to watch our legs as we move. We have a sense of where they are in relation to our arms and in relation to the floor so that we can maintain that continuous movement in a safe way without falling. In this video, you learned about many different sensory processes. You learned about how vision works, and you also learned about taste and hearing, smell and touch and pain. You also learned about phantom limb pain and other sensations. In our next video, which is our final video for this module, you're going to be learning about something called the Gestalt Principles of Organization. So how do we organize the world that we're experiencing? How do we organize what we're seeing and give it meaning? That's what we'll be exploring next.